le cadre de l'exposition jusqu'à la fin le temps, une activité qui est proposée par deux artistes, Mercedes Gertz et Carmen Escar, autour de la table, et qui traite sur la problématique de l'invisibilité des œuvres d'artistes femmes. Donc nous avons une riche discussion avec quatre expertes, cinq expertes, euh, venus de différents horizons artistiques et d'habitude géographiques, qui présenteront des stratégies et expériences tant en France comme en Amérique latine. Tout d'abord, la perspective européenne avec Camille Dorino, co-contractrice et présidente de la web, l'association de la mission et d'intégrer les artistes de femmes du XXe siècle dans l'histoire de l'art, et directrice des expositions et des collections de la monnaie de Paris. Suivi d'une présentation de, euh, sur les stratégies mises en avant au Mexique et en Amérique latine avec Karen Bondello, protonique, historienne de l'art et commissaire de cette exposition. Et dans un deuxième temps, il y aura Alicia Nock, conservatrice au département de l'action contemporaine et prospective au Centre Pompidou, qui nous en parlera de son expérience auprès des artistes femmes de l'Afrique de l'Ouest et de l'Europe centrale. Finalement, Anne-Marie, euh, experte en art latino-américain et contemporain, ayant été la conservatrice principale du MOCA pendant 30 années, il nous donnera une présentation sur les services <coughs> en art latino-américain. Je voudrais remercier les fondateurs, les deux artistes qui ont fait possible cette exposition, cette table ronde et aussi euh, le Fonds national de créateurs de l'art, le FONCA, euh, qui, qui, qui a été notre partenaire pour euh, la programmation parallèle de l'exposition. Et je vous souhaite un très bon débat. N'hésitez pas à poser des questions à la fin pour un meilleur débat justement avec les gens qui sont ici. Merci beaucoup. Bonsoir à toutes et à tous. Euh, merci au, à l'Institut culturel de Mexico de nous accueillir ce soir, au Fonds national de la culture et des arts, FONCA. Euh, un grand merci aussi à WEAR, à Alicia, Alma, Camille et Karen et Mercedes pour sa générosité. La, ta la table ronde de ce soir sera en anglais parce que c'est la lingua franca. Et si vous avez besoin d'une petite traduction, ce sera à la toute fin s'il y a quelque chose que vous n'avez pas compris. Et les questions aussi vont être à la fin. Et bon, quand j'étais étudiante d'histoire de l'art, il n'y avait, avait pas d'études de genre au Mexique. Nous étudions pres, euh, presque pas les femmes artistes, euh, sauf Frida et Maria, mm -hmm. avec leur prénom seulement. Et les hommes, euh, Rivera ou Los Cesiqueiros, utilisaient leur nom de famille. Les femmes étaient presque invisibles. Cette question de l'invisibilité des femmes artistes dans l'histoire de l'art m'a toujours préoccupée. Maintenant, je suis artiste et je dois remercier à toutes les femmes qui nous ont précédées artistes, et sans elles, nous pourrions voir Mercedes et moi, ici, euh, où on est, dans cette exposition, dans les écoles d'art qu'on a fait, et notre parcours, on n'a pas eu la, euh, la, la même trajectoire sans, sans tout ce qui est en nous. Euh, ici, au Centre culturel mexicain, depuis trois ans, on invite euh, des artistes femmes en tandem, une fois par an, pour marquer... Euh, c'est une très bonne initiative et nous sommes très reconnaissants de cette prise de conscience. Mais la plupart des expositions sont encore des hommes artistes. Alors on leur remercie et il y a beaucoup de travail à faire ici et dans toutes les institutions. Et cette table ronde est née à partir des conversations avec Karen Cordero depuis des années, des dialogues avec les membres de WEAR, comme le National Museum of Women in the Arts, avec le Salon de femmes artistes. nous avons le devoir de faire connaître les femmes artistes du passé et du présent et de, sortir, de les sortir de l'oubli et de l'invisibilité. C'est pour ça que nous avons pensé euh, sur ce thème d'activer les archives de femmes artistes. Merci. 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 Merci.
à l'association AWER, je, je rajoute un petit peu dans le programme euh, à la demande de sur la situation en France et le contexte euh, aussi euh, des institutions publiques, comment, parce qu'on est à un moment assez charnière en fait, euh, puisqu'il y a des choses qui se passent. Et je voudrais commencer euh, en évoquant euh, une, une citation de Charlotte Fouché, qui est une chercheuse qu'on a invitée à plusieurs reprises euh, à s'exprimer sur le sujet des artistes femmes. C'est une historienne de l'art qui s'intéresse beaucoup aux artistes femmes, aussi aux, aux historiennes. Euh, de l'art euh, femme et dont elle essaie de retrouver la trace et en fait elle dit que euh, pour la question des femmes artistes il faut passer par le genre de la monographie donc un genre assez classique, retracer les vies retrouver avec finesse les détails de leur vie, mais il faut aussi passer par le quantitatif parce que la question des chiffres est implacable et elle montre euh, le sexisme à l'œuvre dans les mondes de l'art donc moi je vais principalement vous parler de quantitatif, de chiffres et les intervenantes ensuite euh, vont sans doute davantage parler des sources, des monographies qu'elles ont pu établir et euh, des expositions qu'elles ont pu construire à partir de leur recherche. Donc cette pratique du comptage, elle euh, s'engage dans les années 70 avec la deuxième vague du féminisme. Donc il y a plusieurs collectifs d'artistes féministes qui commencent à compter, la présence des artistes femmes dans les expositions, dans les galeries. Euh, je pense que vous connaissez bien le travail des Guerrilla Girls dans les années 80 qui l'ont formalisé. Euh, à travers des affiches, des vidéos, euh, des, des projections euh, sur les immeubles. Donc un travail assez visible et qui reste visible encore aujourd'hui. Mais les comptes ont continué et se sont amplifiés et ils ont aussi été euh, faits par les institutions elles-mêmes à partir des années 2000 et je vais surtout vous parler euh, du cas français. Donc en fait nous on a commencé à compter, enfin quand je dis nous, les institutions publiques ont commencé à compter en 2006 puisque le ministère de la Culture a demandé un rapport sur la présence des femmes dans le secteur plutôt euh, du spectacle vivant. Donc deux, il y a eu deux rapports, en 2006 et en 2009, qui s'interrogeaient sur qui dirigeait les théâtres, qui dirigeait les opéras, qui dirigeait les centres graphiques. Et là, en fait, ça a été une espèce de, de, de coup de poing de réaliser à quel point les chiffres étaient effrayants puisque les directeurs de tous ces établissements-là étaient bien sûr à grande majorité des hommes, mais vraiment à très très grande majorité, c'est-à-dire entre 80 et 90 des cas, euh, c'était des hommes et les femmes étaient très peu présentes à la direction des institutions. Alors on parle euh, des directeurs d'institutions, mais ça découle aussi en fait euh, sur les contenus des programmations, donc euh, les musiques composées, les pièces de théâtre qui sont montées, les œuvres chorégraphiques qui sont jouées, et une majorité écrasante était celle aussi d'hommes. Donc il y a eu ce premier rapport en 2006, un deuxième en 2009, les chiffres n'ont pas tellement changé. Et donc en 2006, quand paraît ce premier rapport, euh, qui vous parlera après son parcours, est en train de commencer ses recherches sur l'exposition L à San Pompidou, qui est un accrochage qui sera présenté à San Pompidou entre 2009 et 2011, uniquement composé d'œuvres d'artistes femmes issues des collections. Et donc, euh, Camille compte aussi. Et donc, elle, elle découvre qu'il y a 18% de femmes artistes qui sont dans les collections du Musée national d'art moderne, et que seulement entre 8 et 10% sont présentées dans les salles. Et c'est aussi cette réflexion-là qui a mené euh, à l'accrochage elle, donc avec 100% d'artistes femmes dans les salles. Les choses progressent encore un peu dans le comptage en 2013, puisque le président de la République, François Hollande, euh, Hollande pardon, crée le au Conseil pour l'égalité femmes-hommes et également un observatoire de l'égalité entre femmes et hommes dans la culture et la communication. Donc en fait là il va y avoir une production de chiffres très spécifiquement sur les établissements qui sont sous tutelle du ministère de la Culture avec une parution annuelle tous les, tous les mars. Et euh, bon, voilà, chaque année il y a cette production de chiffres qui permet de réaliser le chemin à parcourir. Et donc on a eu le sixième rapport qui est paru cette année, et les chiffres sont toujours mauvais, mais bon, cette fois, on a le loisir d'en prendre conscience, puisque ces chiffres sont produits par le ministère, donc je vous en donne quelques-uns. Dans les FRAC, 23% des artistes qui sont exposés sont des femmes. Dans les centres d'art, le score est un petit peu meilleur, c'est 31% des artistes femmes qui sont exposés. Dans le domaine des acquisitions, c'est toujours très bas. Donc le FNAC, qui est le Fonds national d'art contemporain, euh, a acquis en 2016 
euh, acquis en 2016 seulement, seulement 12% de femmes. Donc c'est un chiffre très très faible alors qu'ils avaient fait un bien meilleur score à l'année précédente. Et dans les FRAC, donc les fronts régionaux d'art contemporain, on est à 22%. Mais par contre, il y a quelque chose qui a changé cette année, euh, puisque ce rapport a été accompagné de deux autres documents. Le premier était un rapport rédigé par le Haut Conseil à l'égalité entre les femmes et les hommes, qui s'appelle « Égalité dans la culture, le temps de l'action ». Et donc c'est un rapport qui revient, donc qui, qui revient en fait, on fait célébrant les 10 ans euh, du rapport ANPRA, un peu plus, et en disant que les choses n'ont toujours pas bougé, et par contre qu'il faut agir, et donc ce rapport est établi des propositions, et parmi ces propositions, il y a une, une grande partie qui est consacrée au fait de créer de l'information sur les artistes femmes, ce qui pourra faire évoluer les chiffres en fait dans la programmation. Et à ce rapport, quelques semaines après, euh, la ministre de la Culture s'est aussi engagée, en février 2018, elle a publié une feuille de route qui s'appelle « Égalité 2018-2022 et qui approuve ses recommandations et qui entend euh, les mettre en œuvre. Voilà, c'est un point euh, très rapide de où nous en sommes en France. Donc il reste, euh, comme vous voyez, de très nombreuses choses à faire, mais en tout cas les mentalités changent et surtout les institutions publiques soutiennent des initiatives qui vont dans le sens d'une plus grande visibilité des artistes femmes et je pense que du coup Camille va déjà pouvoir parler en tout cas de, du projet Aware. Um, so we wanted to do this introduction because AWARE is a team now and Anna is responsible for scientific programs. And the reason she was talking about numbers is that um, our action at the uh, Archive of Women Artists Research and Exhibition is to uh, turn around the statistics uh, with a tool, a very simple tool, um, in, in, in order to provide more information on women artists so that students um, visitors or anybody can, can learn more about women artists, show them in exhibitions, acquire them in museums, publish them, write about them, in order to uh, create uh, what we call in French un cercle vertueux, a virtuous cycle, so that all these women artists who have worked and produced works um, are visible in history. So in a few words, uh, as Anna said, my experience, um, my, my wish to create this non-profit came out of this uh, curatorial experience working at Centre Pompidou, showing all these women, in, um, women artists in Centre Pompidou, and uh, experiencing the fact that it was very difficult at the time, now it's 10 years ago, because I had very little information about these works, about these women artists, so I had to work more in order to show them more than if I was showing male artists, because there were very little information about these artists. And I thought at the time that I needed um, some kind of tool uh, to find easily this information. I needed more publication, I needed more information on the works, on the biographies. And so at the time, at Centre Pompidou, I created a website around the exhibition. It was called Elle at, at Centre Pompidou. And when I left the Centre Pompidou, it was really uh, with this idea to recreate another website so that I could create myself the tool that I had needed at the time and that would probably be useful today. So this uh, dialogue between uh, curatorial experience and the show and the archive is a very lively one in my life and I think it should be in a way because exhibitions create information about artists Uh, if only in the catalogue, but just by showing the work, you have to uh, research the works, you have to somehow think about the works, and this is grey matter that will have to be uh, reused in other ways. So, in a way, an exhibition creates archival material, and not all the museums have the means to keep that material, to, to turn it into an archive. And um, I really think that being a creator, um, I, I can be this, create this in-between, between the show, the museum collection, and information. Um, so maybe uh, a few images now. Um, just to go back to one side of my professional life, being uh, art director at La Manette Paris. I was curator a few months ago of a show called Goman House. Uh, 
uh, another this collective woman artist show uh, in Yamonet Paris. Uh, after Elle, we curated with actually Anna a show about African women artists uh, in Le Havre. And this is the third or the fourth of uh, collective women artist show that I curated because I really believe that these shows are necessary today, if only because they create more information about a lot of women artists. Uh, their future archival material for art historians, for students, and even for visitors. So Women House was about um, how women artists have represented the house, domestic space, architecture, and space in general. Just to go back to the theme of tonight's uh, talk, uh, for me, AWARE is really um, a lively place, it's a space, it's a platform, and it's also nourished uh, by my experience as a director, as a curator, because both really sides are uh, complementary. Uh, compl <laughs> <laughs> um, they, they enrich each other, they nourish each other. Uh, both uh, are for me ways to get in touch with artists, either alive or historical artists. Uh, and my practice as a creator is very important too because uh, space, real space, is uh, also a way to experience virtual space and the, the other side, is, the other way is true too. But it's also a collective work, uh, shows are also a collective <coughs> experience. Um, the AWARE team is, is a small group, a very uh, dynamic people, also of a, of a younger generation than me, and that's also very important to have this uh, new uh, view on the, on the subject and again uh, each symposium, each, each round table is a way to meet new people to, um, to confront our point of view to others point of view so I'm very happy that you are uh, so many tonight although it's very hot and I don't see enough men in the room <laughs> but again it's always the case so thank you for your attention a few more images of the recent events we did image of the prize which was given by the Minister of Culture in France, a show we did in Les Archives for the last edition of the World Prize, and a very last program we initiated a few months ago called Paris et uh, in public space because I believe that public space is the last um, plafond de verre, is the last glass ceiling. Really. Uh, because there have been very few commissions um, to women artists, so there are very few in public space, and it's probably <coughs> for the next challenge. So that's the last uh, of our uh, program in a way. Thank you very much. And I'm going to talk a little bit today about some, some of the ways in which feminist art and feminist art history in Mexico have worked to visualize and analyze the work of women artists, but more importantly to explore new ways of narrating art history, and particularly the history of women artists from a feminist perspective on the basis of a critique of the hierarchical power relations and pose of objectivity that tend to inform those, those fields. So, I'm just going to start um, in a way in parallel to what Hannah um, spoke of for with some hard facts, we could say recent statistics in Mexico which were drawn from the research of Betsabe Romero, a visual artist, and <coughs> an art historian a few years ago, but I don't think they've, they've changed too much. And as we can see, the panorama is also um, somewhat bleak, maybe even sort of parallel, but a little, perhaps a little worse even in some cases to what Hannah described for France. Um, while we can find that the gender balance in art schools and in the applications for government art grants, and even the grants that are given today is equal, once people come out of school and go into the workplace as artists, the problems begin. <laughs> so we can find that in galleries, only between 11 and 30% of the artists are women. 
In auctions, maybe <coughs> one to six percent of the artists whose work appeared are women. In public museums, six to 16 percent of the exhibitions include works by women, and in private museums, between 18 and 26 percent. But of course, they are to do where they are in the museums, how much space they are allotted, and in in relation to what uh, other other artists or publics. In the collections of the major public museums, the risk the representation of women's work is between 4 and 11 percent. And when we go to see just in the major public museums how many in individual exhibitions of women artists, we find that in the National Museum of Art, the most recent individual exhibit of a woman artist was in 1992. Actually, this is just about to change. I think next week they're opening their first <laughs> individual exhibit of an artist from the 19. Uh, well, the 1920s and 30s, now we all leave. Um, the National Museum of Art will be an aggregating an exhibit of her work, so they're breaking their own record. <laughs> and the National Museum of San Carlos, which is a kind of more historical museum, has never had an ex individual exhibition of a woman artist in 45 years. And in the Palace of Fine Arts, which is kind of the major, um, let's say, uh, central museum for uh, fine arts in, in the center of Mexico City. The exhibits of women artists have been 12 out of 80 since 1995. So, um, so um, we could say that the role of women artists in feminist art is relegated in the principle, we could say, macro narratives of Mexican art history, even contemporary art history, where one might imagine that women play a more prominent role. And we can see this in the case of two uh, major exhibitions just in the last 10 years, one defying stability and the other the age of discrepancies, which attempted to present panoramic visions of Mexican art from 1952 to 67 and 68 to 97 respectively. <coughs> Although this is, not, this is not directly related to those exhibitions, we could almost see it as a reaction uh, in 2008, the photographer and feminist activist Lucero Gonzalez founded MUMA, the Virtual Museum of Mexican Women Artists. And this year we're celebrating our 10th anniversary. It's a museum which is an online museum website, kind of similar to AWARE. And it's coordinated collectively by a group of feminist artists, art historians, and art journalists. It has an online platform, which includes bi-monthly exhibitions. Um, here you can see this, I'll just go through and show some of them. In 10 years, we've had 43 exhibitions. And though they're mainly online, and one of the interesting things about being an online museum is you have online all the 43 exhibitions, which they have been over the past 10 years. Um, so you can go see them. And uh, some of them have become physical exhibitions, and in other cases, some of them document physical exhibitions. We hope that very soon this exhibition, in fact, with Mercedes and Carrie, will be part of be part of MoMA. Here's just one example of one, one recent exhibition by Judith Romero, which is uh, she's a photographer and did testimonies and photographs of women who have decided not to have children. And there's also, and similarly again to AWARE, there's an online gallery, you could say, or archive of women artists in various media, media however, almost only of, of Mexican women artists. And each one also has a kind of text and a selection of images. And there's also an online library Biblioteca and Women in <coughs> Artists Alliances, which gives people an access to information and in some, uh, in some way tries to <coughs> avoid the problem that people always say, where can I find information on, on women artists and, and women in art and students who want to study this can go there and find often uh, different basic texts, bibliography, which they allow them to navigate in this field. And it's also a, a way of 
putting texts about Mexican women artists out there. So um, there also have been other ways through the work of artists themselves of addressing this invisibility of feminist art in more performative ways. One of them is the work, the performative work at Chiva, which was created in 2013 by the Mexican pioneering artist, feminist artist, Monica Meyer. And she created in, in 2013 this project ironically titled Archiva, Masterpieces of Feminist Art in Mexico. And as she points out in the quote you can see here, her definition of feminist art is that the artists are defined as feminist by their practice. Um, not necessarily uh, all of them are militant <coughs> or activists and, as feminists, but on the basis of the, both the context and the context of their work, she defines them as feminist artists. And this has actually been a very useful definition for me, and I think it's a, it's a useful tool for, uh, in, a, in a situation where often both feminism and feminist art are not very clearly understood. What is feminist art? What makes it feminist? Who is a, who is a feminist artist? So, uh, Archiva includes 70 odd uh, artists, each of them with a Part with information on their work. And Monica uses this archive in a, in a performative way to intervene, you could say, in the art system in Mexico. She has the physical archive, which she donated to various museums. But when she originally inaugurated this project, she also went around to de deliberately put it out there in the consciousness of different publics. First and foremost, the feminists themselves, who often many feminists, uh, in, you know, people in feminist groups are not aware or don't really consider art as an important part of feminism or an important uh, tool for feminism. So she went, you can see here, to the uh, National Feminist Congress in Guadalajara and went around like a street vendor. <coughs> These different pieces of Archiva hanging all over her, sat down the stairs so that people couldn't avoid looking at her and went around and talked to the people in the Congress and explained what, uh, what art did in relation to feminism. So this was a more kind of interactive way in keeping, as we'll see with her work, for uh, creating a, an archive of feminist art. Okay. Um, and well, another way in which um, in feminist, feminist art has tried to intervene in the public consciousness actually arose from the, as an activation of the presentation of Archiva in a, what we call a retro collective exhibition of Monica's work at the University of Museum of Contemporary Art in 2016. And there we inaugurated uh, the uh, Wikipedia edit-a-thon, I guess you would call it, uh, of women artists, which is linked to the broader art and feminist project based in New York and now is an international movement, basically with the idea of not only including more Mexican women artists in Wikipedia, which is uh, one of the most widely consulted uh, encyclopedias online, but also very important to changing the ways in which in Wikipedia the, right, the people write and therefore read about art. Often feminist artists or women artists in general are identified by their relation to other artists. In many cases, as we can see in this one small example, uh, women artists, when recognized, are often linked to or validated in relation to a genealogy of male artists and an art history dominated by male artists and masculine subjectivities and social experience. Mm -hmm. Just as one example, the Mexican artist Isagradua was praised by um, Rufino Tamayo for the virility of her work, which of course was a good thing. <laughs> okay, I'll go, I'll go quicker. And but how much more time do I have? Two minutes. <laughs> so, like I one. Okay, well, I'll leave out about half of this, yes. But um, in the discussion. So the role of the 
archive is also an important element, as Carrie mentioned, for recuperating the lives and the work of, of women artists. And Maria Izquierdo was, was acquired recently by the Museum of Modern Art in Mexico City, and a few years ago they did an exhibit of her work, some examples of which you can see here. And there, uh, through that archive, it's possible to see her not only as an extraordinary painter and uh, artist, but also as a writer, as a mediator, as a cultural ambassador in, uh, in various parts of Latin America, and also to see the very striking reaction and very painful reaction she had when um, her mural commission in the city hall of Mexico City was canceled at the, in 1945 at the request of artists like Diego Rivera and David Alfaro's games. So here are some images of that work. And well, one of the interesting things I'd like to talk about is also, as a university professor and a teacher, one of the most important tools that we have used is working with students and with archives of women artists getting them there into the archive very physically, as was the case when we worked with the archive of Fanny Rabel, who's an artist of the um, of, of Polish origin who came to Mexico early in her life and was a very important artist from the 1920s, 30s up to, well, she, she actually died about um, 10 years ago. So we, you can see here how we actually went into her former studio and the students and, and us were able to go through piles of books, papers, graphic, artistic works and uh, create an exhibition which was called to participate in the creation of justice, recuperating the work of Fanny Ravel and to create an exhibition which permitted us both to realize that she was a very important writer, she had, did a lot of work writing theater, poetry, art criticism, and a kind of chronicles, one might say, of a whole lot of different events. She published in the newspaper, we had the texts of her course lectures, and so this was a very important aspect of her work. And also, Fanny Ravel is known as, mostly as a painter of children, of course, kind of stereotypical for women, and in fact, she did very many wonderful paintings of children, such as the mural from the Museum of Anthropology, which you can see up there on the left. But she also had an extraordinary num num number of works which are not very well known, which deal with the fragility of memory, as the one you can see on the upper right, uh, the, the isolation of people in the contemporary technological world and in uh, a city which now seems kind of ironic, but in the 1970s and 80s were conceived as a very hostile and violent environment. Okay. So, I'm not, I'm, I think I'm obviously not going to be able to cover all this material, I'll just go quickly through and mention in about two minutes just a couple of more things I wanted to mention. Uh, um, one of the other aspects which is, I think is really important is the creation of feminist strategies of writing and curatorship, the very the important book for me in this respect has been, was Grisenda Pollock's book, Encounters in the Virtual Feminist Museum, Time, Space, and the Archive. And with students in the university, we've done a number of exhibitions, which fortunately have allowed us the freedom to kind of turn around the narratives of Mexican art and Mexican art history, such as this one in, on the occasion of the bicentennial, of supposedly Mexican independence and the, and the centennial of the Mexican Revolution, and seeing, rereading the idea of the centennial and bicentennial and the idea of revolution and independence from a, the perspective of gender. Uh, another exhibition which worked with an archive which was of a feminist militant and photographer, Ana Victoria Jimenez, which was then donated to the University and where a group of younger artists worked with this archive and created interactive conceptual artworks, such as the one you can see here on the left, which reactivated some of the documentation in the archive, such as this poster. And uh, just two years ago, the retro collective ex exhibit I mentioned of Monica Meyer, in which we reactivated several of her participatory and 
performance pieces. And essentially, I would say the exhibition was not an exhibition to be only contemplated, but it was really very important to us that this educational and participatory part of the work introduced the kind of uh, public interaction and work in public space, which is an essential part of the work, into the space of the museum. So we did that with a number of historical works, which were then taken up again, particularly in the case of the clothesline, which is perhaps one of her best known works and was in this, on the occasion of this exhibition dealt with harassment and became kind of viral and was taken up not only in the museum, that we received over 8,000 testimonies in relation to harassment. You can sort of see that here, but it was taken up by people all over the city and all over the country and others were taken up by people in many parts of the world as a both artistic and activist tool. And, the, and another piece, I'm finishing. <laughs> um, here, the, uh, abrazos or embraces, um, other pieces were activated. And more recently, there's a, a, a feminist performance artist, Julian Tivilo, has done additional work reactivating feminist archives. And I'd like to just end up mentioning briefly the show, Radical Women Latin America, 1960 to 85, which was recently in the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles, which was a kind of larger archive and located Mexican feminist art of the 60s and 70s in the context <coughs> of Latin American art and really made it possible to see these artists in relation to both well-known and less well-known artists and I think has been an important tool, kind of overwhelming, which has put a lot of information out there which I will take up and make known older publications and newer publications, hopefully to contribute the, to the creation of new and renovated and narratives of Mexican and Latin American women's and feminist star. Thank you. There are two words that resonate a lot to me. Um, the first one is invisibilization, and the other one is women. Um, so of course they often go together, um, but I would say that my, um, my action uh, and dedication within the Centre Pompidou as a curator for contemporary art um, kind of um, deals with different types of invisible uh, artists. Um, and because I'm uh, not only trying to, um, well, to expand the collection and the museum program um, towards, well, more female artists in the collection, but also try to expand the collection towards Africa and the diaspora, African-American artists that are missing in the collection, and uh, Central Europe. Um, so, of course, I really hope to kind of be able to cross all the criteria at some point, but I must say that for the moment I have to, uh, I'm acting step by step. Uh, and so, uh, of course, women have been, female artists have been uh, something I, I've been uh, fighting for. And in this sense, I also wanted to, uh, uh, this talk actually gives me the opportunity to thank Camille, uh, Camille Morino, because uh, without her, uh, action and without Elle at the Centre Pompidou, I think it would be much more difficult for me to be able to continue this battle and fight this battle uh, also um, in, um, well, in an expanded way, I, I hope. Um, so I don't know if I should be completely terrified by the, the numbers uh, Hannah just mentioned when we started, or if, if then I should be reassured by the Mexican numbers that are so terrifying. Uh, but I would say, and I think I can, I can say that, uh, there is still a very long way to go within the Centre Pompidou and within public institutions in France to, um, well, to be able to show more women artists, um, collect more women artists, and show them within uh, of course, solo shows, um, maybe shows that are still dedicated to women, of course, and but also thematical shows, historical shows, contemporary shows, and all the shows that we uh, always go to. Um, so um, I, I just I realized preparing this talk that in a way uh, my dedication towards women 
actually um, well reached every single field of action uh, uh, within the Pompidou that I'm really operating in. Um, and so I just wanted to show you a few examples very quickly because it's, um, I don't think it's super interesting, but, um, but just, it, it just gave, gave me a sense of uh, realizing that in a way uh, my, this relationship was to me very organic, uh, that um, I mean fighting for women is a very obvious thing and acquiring them and showing them is also quite, uh, quite organic. And I realized that um, most, I mean, mostly I've acquired more than 50% of women, uh, and I've showed at least 50% of women in the shows that I've been curating. Um, it could be more, um, and, but it's still, uh, it's still something. So thanks for this talk, for helping me to kind of collect all the information. So for example, uh, so I, I've, I've been at the Pompidou for three years, um, and of course I don't have enormous budget, uh, but I just wanted to show you a few examples of women artists that I that I acquired. Um, so as I told you, I've been focusing on specific regions, so they mostly come from those regions, so we have several names here, uh, and I and I also acquired um, women, of course, that are not, that are also French and, um, and from other countries. Um, so for example, one, one acquisition that I very happy to, to, to make with Marcia Kure. She's an artist from Nigeria. And, um, and it's also a work that is um, a homage to women. Uh, it's called The Three Graces. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's a nod to classical painting because the three graces are actually, well, uh, one of them is um, an Amazon uh, and um, referring to uh, the army of Amazons in Daomi. Benin, uh, because you know that there is an army of women there. Um, the second figure is a Nigerian Zulu queen, and the third one uh, is the, the um, wife of uh, activist Fela Kuti, uh, and a very important figure in Nigeria. And of course, crossing different periods of history and different heritage. Uh, so for me, it was uh, very symbolical. It was one of my first acquisitions, and I'm still very happy to um, to have uh, acquired this work, even though I haven't shown it yet. <coughs> it will come soon, I'm sure. Um, another um, very important figure, again Nigerian, even though she is now Belgian and she lives in Antwerp, Otobo and Kanga. I showed one of her, one of her performances in one, in my first show at the Pompidou uh, two years ago. And that was also a very beautiful experience because she transmitted it to um, a group of, uh, of, um, of people and it was very generous and a generous experience. And this work is one for me, one of her iconic works and summarizes her relationship to the body, to performance, to, uh, and it's, it's a work that deals with uh, negotiating the resources of the world um, and, uh, and, uh, and it's called The Weight of Scars, uh, which is quite telling too. Um, another, another example of more historical figures that I inquired, uh, because diving into regions that have, haven't been a really um, well surveyed within the, the museum, I also um, try to, to make more historical acquisitions so that the, uh, the more recent ones are able to be rooted within history. Uh, so I, I was very happy to acquire the work of two South African women of um, a bit older, but that are really fantastic, Sue Williamson, um, with a very important work from the end of the 90s that is dealing with the history of apartheid. And I also acquired a work of uh, Penny Siopis, um, a film uh, dedicated also to this intricate uh, history. Uh, younger positions and also coming from uh, different regions, um, there are different region, which is of course Central Europe, uh, Taos Mahashava with, with an incredible film. Um, uh, that was showed at the Venice Biennial last year and is talking about, um, well, the fragility of, of heritage and how artworks must always be, um, well, considered as something extremely fragile and uh, almost, um, and this film uh, shows a, a ritual uh, where you see them, some works of the Museum of Dagestan, which is a super local museum, 
that are being transported from one mountain to another in a very fragile and, and, and beautiful gesture. Uh, Agnieszka Polska, young Polish artist, um, more historical acquisition that I made thanks to my collaboration with a Polish curator, Karolina Lewandowska, who's doing a great, great work also uh, for women and that I want to um, honor now. Um, the different, uh, well, different fields that I'm also, um, well, I'm also including women, of course, is the monthly screenings that we're doing uh, within the contemporary art and perspective departments. We're invited different women, Jessica Warboys from uh, from the UK, uh, two Russian women, Argasha Alga Nishova, Anaya Mulaiva, an African, uh, African American young filmmaker that I also acquired, and I, recently Agnieszka that I already showed you. I've just launched a series of talks uh, confronting artists and curators that have, that have never met and that meet actually during the conversation. And I've already invited two female curators that are amazing. Uh, Caroline Hancock, based here, but she's here originally from the UK. Maya Cirich from Serbia. And next week, and I hope you can definitely come on the 6th of June at 7 p.m., um, Mam Dara Young, who's a French artist, and Erin Cristovalli from uh, Los Angeles, young um, curator in uh, the Hammer Museum. Um, within the exhibitions, well, I, I, I'm going to skip this. Uh, as I told you, um, this first show that I, met early, that I mentioned earlier, Museum and Off, I invited um, well, 50% of artists, of female artists, uh, that, mean, that meant already 15. And I also, uh, it was a very special show, and I also kind of opened up the conversation to guest curators, and I just realized that I only invited female curators, of course. One from Brazil, one from Serbia, one from Albania, and one from Russia. Um, and one, one of the specific endeavors, uh, I would say, well, I really tried to fight for a different perspective regarding women, was my um, my involvement in the Duchamp Prize in the last two years. Um, kind of, um, I'm not doing it this year, but uh, I've been fighting for the the for the 2016 edition and for the the last one to have at least two women, uh, which um, is now I think something that is that will be stable for the future. Uh, and it wasn't uh, that easy. So you can see here the installation of Ito Bahada and Ula van Brandenburg on the right. Um, and um, and last year Charlotte Moss and Maya and Maya Baevich on the right in the middle to try and uh, well uh, kind of uh, uh, stress this battle that I had uh, I I made this exhibition um, dedicated to the women artists that had been nominated and or that had won the Duchamp Prize. Last year in Basel uh, at the Fondation Ferné Branca, it was called the most foreign country. Uh, it was a homage to Alejandro Pizarnik, uh, the Argentinian poet, um, uh, which I love, and uh, and so a lot of artists from the Duchamp Prize participated, and it was um, a quite well beautiful experience for me, and I think it helped also um, well the Adiaf to try and understand that. In a way, we needed to uh, go beyond uh, well the, this first experience and the first. It's been more than 20 years and try and, and have more women winning the prize and being also nominated. Um, um, and I just wanted to end on a, on a different note. So I was talking about um, my dedication towards invisible people, uh, and it's not only women, sadly. Um, <laughs> And um, I want to talk about a project that I'm curating for next year that is dealing with um, forgotten artist called Ernest Moncoba, and he was the husband of a female artist, Sonia Ferlaf Moncoba, who was Danish. And I just wanted to tell you uh, that within, I mean, in a couple where you have one black artist and one female artist, the female artist actually is, gets better uh, and is more recognized. So. Um, this show will be dedicated to the, the work of Ernest Moncova and not his work because his wife will be shown in a parallel exhibition curated by a colleague called the, um, Jonas Stove, who's the head of the Drawings and Prints department, but it will be definitely a dialogue between, um, between the two artists 
uh, and and this I, I love that statement that I found in the archives. Uh, I mean, surveying his um, his own uh, trajectory in South Africa, and um, this could be the statement of what I want to do within the pulpit. Thank you. an occasion on one hand to have a conversation about the difficulties that women artists encounter in their career, many times solely for being female, and on the other to rejoice in the accolades and the recognition that some are receiving today. Um, so, you know, the world is not perfect, but um, we're trying to make it more balanced and just. <coughs> so during my tenure as curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, I focus mostly on working with underrepresented artists, of which a good number were women. It just so happened that the first and last projects I curated at MOCA were of women artists. The first was Rosangela Renault of Brazil, who conceived a project based on an extensive photographic um, archive documenting tattoos on the bodies of prisoners, alongside stories that alluded to photography that she had found in local newspapers and had been collecting as part of what she called the Universal Archive. Unfortunately, because of the lights, you can't see the text, but the, the, every image was accompanied by um, one or two texts, and they were inscribed in the wall as a scar. She scarred the walls of the museum to create this, this text, and they were in English, Portuguese, and Spanish, which are the languages that she wanted to use in Los Angeles. The last one, an exhibition of the Venezuelan artist Magdalena Fernandez, was initially conceived as a mid-career survey. She would have been the first Latin American woman artist to get this recognition at MOCA. The only other Latin American artist to have an exhibition this large was Gabriel Orozco, whose exhibition had curated in the year 2000. With the advent of a new chief curator in 2015, someone who was preceded by her reputation as a fighter for minorities and underrepresented artists, I was profoundly disappointed when weeks after she settled in, she canceled the Fernandez exhibition, offering a small show instead at the Museum's West Hollywood satellite, so that's where it happened. Uh, Los Angeles Renault's, uh, Los Angeles Renault's 1996 cicatrice, um, the, the title of the exhibition, Scar, inaugurated a period in which the museum committed itself to making artists from Latin America an integral component of its program and collection. So in 1996, MOCA made the decision that we're going to start looking at Latin America on a consistent basis. The reason being, it's proximity to a whole region of Spanish-speaking <coughs> countries and California's Spanish and Mexican history. Conversely, Magdalena Fernandez's 2015 exhibition marked the end of that era, leaving MOCA um, my lady Moka coincided with my belief that the new administration was shifting gears and the commitment wasn't there anymore. At least not in the same way. I felt it was time to exit. So I left the museum three years ago. In the arc of 19 years, I organized 16 projects and exhibitions that involved artists from Latin America. I also worked on a lot of Italian artists and, and also young emerging artists, uh, mostly from the US. So, in addition to the two women artists that I've already mentioned, I created the work of Magdalena Atria, Monica Rubboa, Lucia Clark, Vivian Marin, Anna Mendieta, and Mila Schendel, among others. I also made a concerted effort to bring the work into the permanent collection. The best time was when, when I was organizing the exhibition or when the exhibition was on display because there was this general enthusiasm from the board and the staff and so I thought it was the right time to approach them, acquiring the work, and we did acquire works by many artists. Not Lisa Clark, it became too expensive for us, but we have shown her work several times at MOCA. I also made a concerted effort to bring, well, mindful of the expected and unexpected roadblocks that I would encounter, given the kind of artists I was supporting, I found myself devising strategies to get around them. However, I was also aware that whatever I set out to do, I could not do it alone that I needed someone's support, a cohort of sorts, in a position of power within the museum, who could help me to break down walls and jump over obstacles. I did get some assistance um, from colleagues and some higher-ups, uh, but still the efforts fell short of my goals. I mean, I would have liked to do more, and I was assisted and helped 
and there were collectors who provided funding for acquisitions and exhibitions, but still you always feel like you're not doing enough because women are always underrepresented, no matter what. Despite this, though, through my professional practice, I have always learned that institutions can change their strategies and embrace inclusivity if that's what they want to do. That we, as female art professionals, have to take more seriously the gender imbalance that exists in the art world and focus our energies on correcting it. That we, as female curators, academics, and critics, and the like, need to profit from our positions of authority and ensure that other represented artists, of which women make a large number, are given the opportunities they deserve so that they don't have to wait until they are in their old age to be noticed. Recent examples of this late recognition seem to indicate that older overlooked artists are slowly and finally getting rightfully acknowledged. In a recent article uh, collectively written by the RC editors uh, entitled Getting Their Due, they state, and here I'm quoting the, the, um, the editors, in the past few years, the art world has begun to <coughs> graciously reward artists who have honed their practice over previous decades, while remaining inexplicably under the radar. Artists like these 10 members of the Artsy Vanguard, a new annual list of the 50 most influential talents shaping the future of contemporary art practice, are finally getting their due with museum retrospectives, representation by major international galleries, and surging collector interest. So that's what they said, that was the preface to this article. Then the eight women, there were ten artists, eight were women, two were male artists. Featured in this article are, and this is that really, what is really shocking, 70-year-old Cecilia Vicuña, who is from Chile but lives in New York, 70-year-old Sonia Gomez from Brazil, you know she works in Sao Paulo, 97-year-old Luchita Furtado, who is from Caracas and lives in Santa Monica, California, and he's the mother of the American artist Matt Mullican. And it's interesting because her last exhibition was in 1974, and that was the year that Matt graduated from Colors. And in 10 years, he was a renowned international artist, showing in Los Angeles at MoCA, showing in Europe at the Stellan Week Museum, showing at the Met in New York, and yet his mother stopped showing in 74 until um, 2016. Um, let's see. Um, another other artists that were showcased in the article are 60-year-old Suzanne Trister from England, 72-year-old Anna Bogigian from Egypt, 56-year-old Vera Roberts Tech from Texas, and she's young, she's 56. 71-year-old <laughs> Rochelle Feinstein from New York, and 70-year-old Liz Mager from Canada. Of course, you know, I was excited to hear about this news, but then I began to reflect upon the fact that the youngest artist is 56 years old and the oldest 97. So thank goodness for longevity. And the more I read, the less enthusiastic I became as questions began to form in my mind. Questions that I have asked myself many times. For example, why does it have to be so hard for women artists to attain the recognition that a young male artist is the gets? Why is it that in 2018 we still believe that women artists are not talented as, their male, as much as their male counterparts? Or as the article points out, that many artists who have been, uh, who are now being recognized, have been practicing over decades, remaining inexplicably under the radar. I, I think there's an explanation for that, but it wasn't explained in the article. Cecilia Vicuña eventually got a break in 2017. Her piece, Keep a Womb, the story of the Red Thread Athens, 2017 was a standout at last year's Documenta 14. So maybe some of you saw it if you went to Athens. Uh, since then, the 70-year-old Vicuña has been picked up by Lehman Moppy, a uh, gallery in New York, and the Brooklyn Museum and the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston will be presenting some of her installations this year. Like Vicuña, Luchita Hurtado had a lucky break as well. In 2016, she had a small show of drawings and paintings at a small gallery in Los Angeles. Before this, her most recent exhibition had been at the Women's Building, also in Los Angeles in 1974. So it was very symbolic that her last exhibition was in the Women's Building, which is still standing. Yet she persevered and went on to make art for four decades until someone noticed. So longevity has allowed Hurtado a fascinating life. You know, she belonged to a social circle that included Leonora Carrington, Frida Kahlo, and Diego Rivera in the 1940s in Mexico City. While in the 70s and 80s, along with feminist 
had his via filmings to Chicago and Miriam Shapiro. She was part of a conscious racing group <coughs> in New York. So, Hurtado is being included in Made in LA, the Hammer Museum Biennial opening in Los Angeles this weekend. And despite the fact that today over half of the art students are female in the United States, they do not make 50% of the artists represented in galleries. Commercial galleries justify it as a sales issue. Male artists sell more and more frequently than female artists, are less beholden to the market but still organize more exhibitions of male artists. However, in the last few years, we have seen an uptick in women's shows. So this is really good news. Recent retrospectives in the US um, are, uh, have been of Annie Albers, Darcy Lado Amadeau, Ligia Clark, Tassida Dean, Isa Genskin, jo Jonas, Frida Kahlo, Ana Maria Manolino, Mary Sanders, and Ligia Papp, and many others, but I couldn't name them all. So, they, um, so these museums have rather careers to the attention of new audiences, but as I said before, it's still not enough. Researching the work of Ana Mendieta, I came across some letters from Ana to Hans Breder, her former professor, collaborator, and lover, in which she describes her life and difficulties as an artist trying to make it in 1970s New York. In living in Iowa, where she had grown up and gone to university, Mendieta was aware that this was a significant life-changing event for her, even though she was familiar with New York City. As she and Hans had visited regularly and had friends there, she wasn't sure how she would manage in this new environment. Like many others, Mendieta had arrived in New York, among them war, which means women artists at for and revolution. Because of these perceived opportunities in Soho, the 29-year-old artist decided to try her luck. In her letters to Hans, Mendieta gives us a glimpse of what her life was like at the beginning. Mixing news of the art world, she said, MoMA, is having a retrospective of solo weeks, so I will probably go up town to see it. In another letter, she says, the Kuning is also having a big show of works from 1960 to 1977. She also um, tried to have her work shown, and she tells Hans, um, also, I thanked to Maureen, um, I talked to Maureen Orbach today. She has a new gallery in Chamber Street. She's looking at my work on Teal Space. She was helpful. And then she also, you know, um, describes some of the, her life uh, in the city, the difficulties that she encountered in the city by saying, it looks like I will be needing a part-time job. Things are so expensive here. On one occasion she confesses, I am scared and lonely about my situation, but confident that I will survive. <coughs> on another she laments, tomorrow I have to go to an employment office to get food stamps. <laughs> So were it not for the fact that we know these comments come from Indieta's correspondence to Hans, we could think that she's describing the contemporary life of many women artists today. Eventually, Anna found support among feminist artists. She had a show at AIR, Artists in Residence, a cooperative gallery founded by women to help women. Anna died at 36 years old when her career was finally taken off. The number of exhibitions that have organized that have been organized after her death is staggering. Sadly, she never got to see the success her work enjoys today. So we are at a junction in which the art world is experiencing permanent changes that benefit women artists. People are listening and trying to correct the injustices and the imbalance that continues to make it difficult for them to achieve well-deserved success. I did not address the sexual harassment that women artists face every day because that is the topic of discussion that will require more time than we have. As the number of women artists developing successful careers increases, let's hope the trend will continue by giving them a strong and a stable support structure, by mentoring their talent, and by offering deep friendships, unfettered respect, and collaborations that recognize their gifts and celebrate their achievements. Thank you.